Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 4th of June 2024 ORI FPGA meetup. In this meeting, we talk about what we've done over the past week, what we have planned to do over the next week, if we need any resources, and if we've hit any roadblocks uh, need need help. Here's a, a diagram of our minimum shift keying uh, transceiver for opulent voice. So minimum shift keying modulator and demodulator are the main blocks at the top level. Here's what it looks like uh, as a, um, a graphical user uh, interface element in Vivado. So when you uh, export your IP, get the component.xml file, this is what it looks like. Uh, when you place it in the block diagram. So you can see the interfaces uh, as of this particular version. And here's one of the places where it will be going. This is parts of the reference design from, from analog devices. And it's the transmit DMA on the left um, or direct memory access. So this is the controller uh, for DMA. And then on the right is an unpacker. Uh, so this uh, turns the the fetch, so it's a 64-bit wide fetch in this particular case. Uh, I believe this is on the, the Pluto SDR. Uh, so 64 bits from, from memory, and then it, it packs this into 16-bit um, uh, FIFO for read data uh, to go off to the to the transmitter. Um, and this is this is how the, the reference design is, design is set up. So, so what we're going to do is get in between these two blocks. And the, the unpack block is expecting to get IQ data from, from memory, from DMA. So it's expecting to get 32-bit uh, uh, objects. So this would be 16-bit size, 16-bit Q. And then it'll pack it up correctly uh, for, the, for the transmitter. Um, so what we're doing is... Our, our memory read, the 64 bits, will be 64 bits of, of data. And then what we're going to be doing when we modulate that is taking in one bit at a time. And that one bit flows through our modulator one bit after another. Uh, and then we create uh, the values, the transmit values. Okay, And then we're going to be sending them to the, the unpacker. Now, this isn't, strictly speaking, IQ, uh, but we're... We're going to, um, we're, we're able to send it to the transmit. Uh, so, so what we're what we're going to do is is uh, get in between these two blocks, and we are going to uh, treat the the memory read as data, and then we're going to create our baseband um, signal, and then we're going to send it down down the pipe uh, as I samples an I, uh, and then the Q, I think we're going to set to zero and see how it see how it works. And here is uh, so this is CPAC. This is a, a FIFO interface. This is on the receive side, and you know as as you saw up here, we we do have a uh, a demodulator as well. Um, so we'll have some connections on the, the receive side. And what we're going to be doing is following the same uh, sort of approach that we did in the in the polyphase uh, channelizer. So what we'll do is we'll connect our block up to uh, CPAC, the receive CPAC, and uh, and then the um, receive DMA. So we'll break that that connection, break that that line in the block diagram and put our uh, logic in between those two blocks. Over on uh, Opulent Voice, we have a, a pretty good start on making the uh, state diagram that handles the, the multiplexing of voice and data. So for, for a while now, we've been promising that we are able to handle voice uh, or data over over opulent voice without having to switch to an entirely different mode. Um, in most communications of this type, people are used to having to switch to a packet mode for data and then go back to a voice mode, dedicated voice mode. What we've seen in practice is that people either did packet radio and transmitted data 
or they use a digital voice mode and never really bother with, with data. And there's a few products that I can think of, like the uh, Yesu System Fusion camera microphone that made it a lot easier to just send data uh, over over the air. Uh, but these these sorts of products were well, they're relatively expensive, and uh, not a whole lot of people um, bought them and, and used them. So. That, that's just one example, um, ha being able to, to kind of handle uh, voice or data without having to buy extra equipment or without having to switch, the user would have to switch to a different mode um, or, or connect up different equipment was our goal. And this multiplexing uh, sort of scheme is enabled by a, a state machine that, that controls things. So what you see here are all the different states that, that so far we've, we've found that we've, we've needed. And you start out in idle, and at any time when you get uh, data uh, of, of any type, there's various queues. So we have a authentication and authorization queue for, for that sort of data that's the highest priority. So those are authentication, authorization um, you know, signals that need to go to your, uh, to your payload or to your central node. Or if you have that, or you have voice, or you have chat, or you have uh, file data, um, then in, if any of that happens, then you send a preamble. So you start your transmission. We start out with a preamble. And then depending on what data you have to send, whether it's file, like data, uh, voice, uh, or chat. So, so we set chat apart, uh, like you're typing keyboard to keyboard, that's a special type of data. So we have that as a different priority. The file data, like sending a photograph or, or a document, that's the, the lowest priority. Voice is the highest. Uh, the voice is the highest out of the user types. The very highest uh, priority would be these authentication and authorization messages that that get to go ahead and, and get sent out, um, even if you're even if you are in the middle of a voice call. If there isn't any data at all, then we enter a state called hang time, and we're going to hang out there, and we're going to let our hang time counter run down. While we're there, we're going to send out dummy frames. So our channel is still transmitting. We're still transmitting a signal. It's just that we're waiting. And if, it, if at any point during that hang time, the more data shows up, then we'll go back into the regular state machine. If the hang time counter expires, that's a timeout. We send an end of transmission and then we stop transmitting. We go back to idle and we wait until we have uh, data again. That's it from a little bit further back. This is what it looks like in the model, in the Simulink model. Um, at the top is push to talk signal. And then on the bottom shows that as long as push to talk is high, that we have a frame timer going off. A frame is every 40 milliseconds. Uh, when we looked at this and reviewed it, we realized that uh, this is not the whole story. So this is a sort of an intermediate model result. Um, a frame timer will continue. Uh, when push to talk goes high, that just means that we are activating our our communications resource, and we're we're using it, um, but the frame timer needed to continue. So this is an example of a model showing us uh, where some some faulty logic uh, had crept into the design. Here is what it, the hang time looks like. So on the top, we have uh, preamble is sent, and then voice data is sent. Yeah, on, that coincides with the push to talk being held uh, high. That's on the bottom uh, half of the screen. And you can see that push to talk goes low, but we're going to hang out and wait and send dummy frames. Our hang time counter is counting down, counting down. Uh, we didn't get any new data, no voice, no chat, no nothing. So we, we decide that we're done and we send out an end of transmission. The whole thing starts over again once more data arrives. So that's what it looks like in the model. Here's what it looks like. So when you step back a little bit, the, the state diagram is inside the tan box. Over on the far right is a scope, just to kind of give us a graphical user interface, just to show uh, all the different, uh, you know, 
exchanges, all the different the outputs, uh, what's really going on. You can see the frame timer is an input and we've generated chat and data and authentication and authorization traffic by using uh, random number generators. We have a, a push to talk signal. Now, this this is where we need need to do some more work. The push to talk is separate from the voice queue. So that, that will continue to evolve and change. There's another view of of another change that was added by by simulating and by by spending time with simulation and modeling in that the hang time counter uh, was not decrementing correctly. And what we needed to do was actually have a separate state that we only are going to decrement, decrement our counter on frame time edges. Uh, otherwise, it was using the, the base clock and decrementing way, way too fast. So those are the sorts of things that you capture in, in simulation. On the subject of the uh, received perturbations that we're seeing on the 4FSK version of Opulent Voice, um, not too much has been discovered since the last time we talked. It's only been a few days because of our out of schedule Thursday meeting. Um, I've made another experiment with a, a different receive SDR. Uh, it's another RTL SDR variant. This is a slightly lower spec one with a, a worse uh, local oscillator in it. So it had a larger parts per million error, much larger, uh, like 60 times larger uh, frequency error. And I wanted to swap something in with a different frequency error so I could verify that the frequency error and the resulting time tracking uh, was causative. And of course, I haven't proved causation yet because that's really hard to do. But I have uh, demonstrated that the results are consistent with the theory. Uh, when I changed that to the RTL-SDR with a higher frequency error, I get much faster time tracking, so it slips a symbol time uh, about every three frames, roughly on average, which is a lot faster than it was doing before because frequency error is bigger. And uh, sure enough, we see the same sort of behavior where the metrics for receive, including the Viterbi cost and the EVM, the acronym you have to remind me about again. Error vector magnitude. Stands for that. And um, they both peak up uh, when the in sync with the time slips. So I, I don't know much about how all this stuff is supposed to work. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe this is normal behavior. It does seem to uh, receive error free despite these perturbations uh, with the signal level we're at, which is not very much above the threshold. If you put another 10 dB in, it stops receiving. I don't have, well, actually I do have, I just haven't used the fine control of, uh, of attenuation in order to get a little closer to the threshold. Maybe that would be a worthwhile experiment. Um, but this may all end up being a sidetrack. Yeah. Or it may end up being performance improvement if I can find something that's wrong in the implementation, which I, I still suspect. I just don't really know for sure. The, the next step after that remains to uh, to make the frequency acquisition smarter so that these frequency errors, uh, which have to be dialed out for frequency currently and then tracked out by the software for for time, uh, it should, should be able to acquire and, uh, and demodulate this without any help from the human. Yeah, that would be a big step forward. I'm not sure exactly how I want to go about doing that. Well, I haven't started going about it yet. Um, some, maybe some study or some, some pondering is still required. Always. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, thank you very much for all of the work. There's a lot of really good looking um, diagrams and, and graphs in the Slack channel. Um, so I, I appreciate I'm, anybody taking a close look at those that hasn't already done so. Uh, in particular, the the graph that shows the individual samples uh, put into the buffer 10 apart and then the whole thing run through a filter in order to get 10 times sampling, uh, which is a number we inherited. And 
you'd think with 10 times sampling that a single sample slip would have a minimal impact. You wouldn't be able to see any big degradation from that. Not zero, but it should be should be small, just intuitively. And uh, if that filter is wrong somehow, then that would account for some additional perturbation. So Michelle and I both looked at that graph and they look it looks plausible. Maybe it's right. Probably it's right. But I don't like the way it's behaving in the receiver. So there we go. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a pile of things to do over the next week. Um, my instinct is that I think it's working well, and um, but we also did make some some changes to this design to increase the you know the increase at pretty much everything the data rate frame size and um, there's some things that that we may not have have uh, handled as as good as we could. We've made a, a lot of improvements and you know, the performance is, is pretty good, but if we are leaving anything on the table, then now's the, the time to, to really go in and clean it up. So yeah, I can, I can help over the next week. Okay. The, when I ha have the microphone here, I'll, I'll give my zero report for, uh, uh, for remote lab, nothing has changed that I'm aware of in the remote lab in the last week or so. Yeah, it's been working really well for for me and the folks I work with. So, so thank you. Okay, and then I'll turn the floor over to uh, Ken, who is working hard on a difficult problem, and that is to to set up the profile uh, for the ADRV nine thousand nine and uh, to get it get it up and running. So. Um, let us know how it's going. Yeah, um, mainly been looking at the uh, constraints. The ADRV uh, 9009 is a pretty wide bandwidth radio. And uh, saying you want to adopt the LTE uh, radio plan, it's actually more suited towards 5G and, um, you know, 100 megahertz type bandwidth. So, 20 is kind of skirting the lower end of, of what it's capable of and kind of the, the more preferential or more standard type of um, sample rates that you might find on a typical LTE implementation. Doesn't look like it's quite doable uh, with the constraints. Um, so I've got a profile that it seems fine. Uh, it's not, it's basically using 80 megahertz uh, as opposed to like because there's this uh, there's this uh, factor of 1.2288 floating around in all the numerology for for LTE and the 5G specs that it, it tends to go in like this power uh, there's this um, factor of three like you'll see three three thousand three three dot or 30.72 megahertz is a typical sample rate so if we if we change that instead to to 40.96, um, we can get a profile that gets through the uh, wizard, and that wizard can, uh, it basically outputs a file that I, uh, is compatible with TES. I, it can be, um, but basically, it's not quite um, what you typically see, but it seems, it seems okay. I, I'm still kind of scouring the the web for anybody that's doing like an LTE based uh, implementation for this. I haven't come across anything though at this point. So I think what we have is is reasonable, but it's a little kind of off the beaten path. So trying to understand what the implications of that would be. That's uh, yeah, we have we have a profile that we can try and move forward with. It's basically a 40 megahertz. Uh, sample rate and a 20 megahertz bandwidth uh, for, for receive and transmit. Oh. Okay. Did I say that right? No, 80, 80 megahertz sample rate. And it, oh, yeah, the active part of the, the bandwidth is 20 megahertz. There's a, you actually have to have an expansion factor for the transmit and it goes to 40, so.
is the expansion factor what we talked about with is that the uh, like for dpd or i i think it's to allow real world filter cutoff uh transitions you know you you can't make it exactly 20 megahertz so i i think the minimum is about a 20 percent roll off factor uh with the filters that they have but uh of going with 40 uh, it should make it even easier to meet the the specs and just given the yeah just given the oversampling that we're doing on the with 80 megahertz it's it's fine to to go with that so um, but yeah looking yeah, that's another thing i'm trying to understand is uh, what the implications of, of that factor is um looking at other lte or uh, 5G radios for what they use. Yeah, 5G is a fine model too. So don't think that you're somehow limited to looking at LTE examples. Um, so it, whatever works. I, I know that, you know, at least for the hardware that we have in the lab, that the 122.88 is, that's the clock. Everything is going to be a, is based off of that. So we'll, we don't want to fight the tool uh, or fight the hardware too hard. Um, and I do understand that we're kind of on the lower end. So all that makes sense. Um, and looking forward to, to trying it out. It sounds like that we're going to have to go back to the polyphase filter bank uh, or polyphase channelizer and, and rerun all of that. Um. I'm not sure the uh, if you input the twenty like right now the the polyphase filter chain it's assuming uh, that when, when I implemented it, it was assuming a ten megahertz uh, sample rate. Um, if you go with a forty megahertz, um, you if you have you widen up the frequency bins. Uh, basically you know increase the data rate accordingly i we were already planning on doing that to, to bring it to 20. um we can also expand the uh fft another division so that, you know eff effectively um keep the 20 mega the, the same frequency divisions that we'd have with 20 just with a deeper fft um so that means, yeah, the receiver, your receiver chain would input at a 40 megahertz, 40 megahertz sample rate, but it would be on a, a 20 megahertz wide uh, bandwidth. So meets Nyquist and uh, yeah, I, I there might be a factor too that we have to increase the FFT on, but I'll be looking at that. Okay, so it sounds like it might be something we could hand edit, or would you have to regenerate the code from the server? It's a parameter that that you okay. pass in on the FFT side. Cool. F F FFT size, yeah. There's probably some hard coding that I would have to adjust. Um, but it's it's uh, it's something that you can tweak tweak to the design without too much complication. Although it would it would increase, you know, by adding an, another butterfly stage to the FFT depth that it increases that size a bit so that's one thing we have to be careful with is uh not blowing out the fpga size that we have yeah i'm very curious to see how much it takes yeah i think when we were doing the bit file we took it through to bit file and i think it was only like 25 percent or something the last time we looked at this but you know that was only the receiver part and we got to be, want to generally keep things under 
50 or 60 percent anyway so yeah looking forward to finding out hopefully we'll be able to do this over the next week yep okay thank you very much that's lots of work all right um and hi, hi matthew if you would like to to share what uh Share your thoughts and what you've been up to, what you have planned, and any roadblocks or uh, or any resources needed. You have the floor. Okay, thanks. Um, I've not had much time in the last week to look at um, any of the MSK stuff. I'm hoping I can get back to it this week, and then I but I uh, did put together a block diagram of a kind of a proposed system, and I've sent it to you for initial review you know, see if it's even worth discussing with everybody. Um, yeah, so that, that's pretty much it. So yeah, I want, I do want to get back to the MSK modem. Um, I, I, when I was cleaning up the code, I broke the timing loop somehow. It should be fairly easy to fix, but I just got to dig, dig around and find that. And then I'm still, um, adding the AXIS interface, uh, for the, for the transmit samples. Um, I think that's done or nearly done, but I haven't, well, maybe I've simulated it. Um, and, but I need to do the same for the, for the samples, the transmit samples on the output. Um, so I think that's still pending. So anyways, those face, those interfaces are coming along um, and probably nearly ready. And I'm making it parameterizable so that we can change the bit widths, you know, to meet whatever system it's in. Um, and then uh, beyond that, I think there's still some system analysis to be done to make sure all the bit widths make sense and, um, you know, that the timing loop will be stable and that sort of thing. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we spoke briefly about the um, about the interface, so I showed some, some diagrams, uh, the same ones that were on Slack. Uh, and you know, showing like on the receive side, there's this FIFO and on the transmit side, there's an AXI. Uh, and that for like the the Pluto, we have a 64 bit wide um, interface. And then on the larger chips, it goes up to 128. And uh, so I just explained like, that's that's what we're talking about when we say we have to fit. Cause you know, if we're gonna run a modulate and you take in one bit at a time, you know, you're reading over 64 from memory and then going through that 64 and then making another AXI transaction to get the next from memory. And the way that the reference design is set up, though, is that it, it kind of assumes it's getting IQ samples, you know, so 32-bit, 16i, 16q. So that's how it's kind of assuming. But we're not treating that as IQ samples. We're treating them as, as data. So that means that we have this, this handshake back and forth on the transmit side. And then, but on the other side of the the, of our transmitter, we are providing what the the rest of the design uh, expects. So it's it's really kind of fun, um, and I'm a little less sure about what happens on the the receiver. I think there's less like change from the underlying assumptions from the reference design on on the receiver, you know, because we're getting samples, uh, you know, over from over the air, and and then we we treat them, you know, this is this is samples from over the air, so. So less change there, um, I, I, didn't, I, I believe. On that, well, well, yes and no. I mean, um, like even the transmit samples are, they're not IQ. True, they're not. You so, mentioned that last week and I, I remember. I, we'll I we'll have to do a little bit more. I, I mean, but I don't think it matters. You, you can put them on line channel and zero the Q channel. Yes. And I think that nothing, everything should be fine. And then kind of the same thing on the receiver is that you were, it's getting IQ samples, right? But we can just drop the Q channel probably and, and just demodulate the I channel. I think that should work, you know? And if it doesn't, then we're, we're we'll. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it could work. But I mean, you know, IQ, the quadrant, you know, you're just sampling with the cosine or the sine, but, you know, so, so if you're just taking the I, you're just using, it's more like, you know, if you hadn't had a mixer, they didn't have the Q channel, right? Yeah. So um, I think it should be fine. 
I mean, your only downside is you're having your sample rate and having your Nyquist, but I don't think that's that should be an issue for us. It shouldn't, and if it is, we'll fix it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, it's uh, lots of great stuff. This is uh, this is fabulous. We've gotten some some feedback. There's uh, several people very interested in whether or not we can fit this into the Pluto, uh, and we we might, especially uh, with the you know with with good clean code. Um, I think that you can we can see the difference between like what we generated using HDL coder, um, and and that that even though it's it's is human readable and, and kind of nice that it uh, as soon as I went to go try to uh, you know write essentially write it to the 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 chip that's in the Pluto, um, you know just even a small part of the of the transmitter swamped the the uh, the chip. So uh, with some, you know, clean, <laughs> this will be a really good comparison to see when we, when we put, you know, put the IP in and stitch it in uh, like we know how to do now uh, and then see the, see the sort of the difference in, in resource usage. Um, and, uh, you know, and no worries if it doesn't, if we just cannot cram it in for, for whatever reason, then we'll, we'll move up to, to a larger chip. Uh, the really nice thing about the Pluto is that people can buy it. It's a, a standalone SDR uh, with lots of support. And that would be really, really nice if we could do that. Um, if Since we want to use a transceiver, we want a transmitter and a receiver, we can't really do the trick that Everest did with the DVBS2 uh, modulator, uh, where he just turned off the, the receiver because he was just using it as a transmitter. Um, since we kind of really want to have both, then then we're going to have to make it fit with the long side, the reference design. There may be other things in the reference design that we can reduce or, you know, compact, but uh, it'll be an interesting challenge. So we've gotten a lot of questions about like, how exactly are you going to cram everything in there? Um, so lots well, of interest. Yeah, you know, the um, some of the functions, I, you know, we'll have to see how the tool maps them. If it, you know, if the tool does a good job, it'll put the um, sine cosine lookup tables in a block ram. Uh, if it doesn't, you know, we can go force it to do that. And that would, you know, that'll save a lot of resources. Yeah, that's but, what didn't happen with my experiment. It did not put my lookup tables in block RAM. And it yeah. made them in just a, it was a pretty naive, I think, uh, lookup table implementation for, yeah. so yeah. that was the thing I first noticed. Yeah, I mean, typically, you know, lookup tables that, you know, like, you know, coefficient lookup tables, if they're not super big, they'll just put it in, in distributed RAM versus a block RAM. So you have to go in and, you know, in a worst case, instantiate the block RAM, um, you know, which is kind of sucky, but, you know, it, it, it's sometimes what you have to do to get the results you need. Um, so hand tweaking, hand tuning things. And the same thing with the um, multipliers and adders, although there's not a lot of them, but making sure they're using the DSP slices because um, that, you know, reduces uh, the usage of the LUTs, which is probably the most critical or the most impacted resource. Yeah, plenty to look forward to. This is this is really pretty exciting. Um, yeah, and we got some, there's a other, a couple of other comments about, about some of the other uh, work. So all, all uh, positive and uh, interested in in uh, in seeing it, uh, got one question about where your code was. So I explained that that it it's right now it's on the VM in a repo on the VM, and we're going to move it to the uh, public repo real soon. <laughs> it would be really nice to have it uh, to, to go ahead and at least try it on the the Pluto to try the the you know and, and give that a shot and then and then move it, um, but. I don't know if there's anything stopping us from going ahead and moving it to the public repository. So that was a that was a question I I got um, off of social media. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, it we probably just want to if there's any headers or whatever you know copyright statements or whatever we need, if I can add those to um the files so that they're properly yeah <laughs> noted or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So they we have the right the right stuff in them. Yeah, our approach is pretty simplistic. We we just we have a, a default 
uh, you use a default license, uh, the CERN open hardware license, the version 2.0 is what we default to use. And a lot of times people just say, put it in the repository uh, license.md. Um, but, you know, it's a little bit better to go ahead and include things like that on, on the header of every file. Um, and then, yeah, the, the approach to having like a modular library, you know, the, that this is built from these blocks uh, and, and these blocks are, are also available. Uh, got a lot of, a lot of positive feedback. Yeah. So. And right now they're all kind of in the MSK repo. So I need to split them out into, you know, the blocks that make sense, you know, split those out into their own. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like there should be some sort of like intelligent way to, to kind of express it uh, as, Surely this is a problem that's that other people have solved. Um, you know, like here's your here's your library and here's specific here's how these were put together. Um, I'm pretty sure that that's probably how the the HDL reference design at analog devices first started out. Uh, you can sort of see evidence of that. So you know this is all it's always a balance between the power powerfully complex and <laughs> and simple and you have to do more you know to make the legos work so it's uh it really I think api is you know i mean it is very complex with all the scripts and everything they've done but i mean to me like there should be like even the msk modulator demodulator would have their own entries into you know have their own repo right and then there would be another repo that's like a project repo that's um brings together all the pieces uh, uh, of the project that, and so it references the other repos, or even if you're doing Git, you can use submodules. Um, yeah. So can, I mean, it gets complicated, but I mean, I found that to work pretty well for managing a big project. Yeah, we had we had a, a, a an amount of 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 luck and and good experience using the submodule approach for the DVBS two work where. The DVBS2 encoder was brought in as a submodule. We treated the HDL reference design, you know, as a, I think it may have even ended up as a submodule, and the FPGA cores, and uh, what, what uh, Swato called third-party stuff, you know, so all brought in, and the, the then the advantage was that this made things look extremely clean, and and it it just worked as long as everything was lined up. The the I we had. The problem was when something like the HDL reference design was updated and then going back in and telling the recipe, I guess, uh, you know, telling our script, um, trying to update the submodules. Uh, I bricked the repo at least twice to trying to do that. So the, the only, you know, there was tremendous advantages in, in this one direction that we really liked, but then attempting to like update or change the recipe, um, you really have to know the exact git command <laughs> and you have to do things in the right order we found out yeah. so that kind of was the only downside and that's really something that if you do it all the time you know or document the process really well then then it won't uh, bite you um and yeah people people then trying to to use the work uh the feedback was wow this is this is really great and clean but people that weren't familiar with submodules um may not have known to type in there's a way that you when you clone things that it goes and gets the submodules. It's easy to skip over that or to not know about that if you just clone the repo. Then so people would not get all of the project. They would get hardly anything because everything was a submodule. So, so usually in the, in the top level repo, I would have like a scripts folder and you can have a script in there that, that does that. So that yes, yeah, that is exactly what ended up happening. So that. After a number of times of even all of us forgetting, you know, yeah, you I, offload that to like to that script. Even like that, integrate that into a make file potentially, so you can just you know make clone or something, and and it would go do all that stuff. Um, yeah. Yep. These are these are all really good lessons learned to <laughs> to then keep keep learned. <laughs> awesome. All right. Any anything else or anybody? Anybody have any questions about anything? Cool. Okay. Thanks, everybody. It's been a been a great week so far. Looking forward to the rest of it and uh, coming back in a week and talking about all these amazing things that we have planned. All right. See you soon. All right. Thank you.